This is episode 133 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 133 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Ross Nadai on the show. You might recognize that name because Ross has his own podcast. And uh, we got on to talking about a number of different things. But most importantly, Ross is a fairly new investor when it comes to active investing, really just been at it just under a year. And he's taken his portfolio from nearly nothing to already at 20 units. And he's showing no signs of slowing down. So Ross doesn't make excuses. He's an action taker and he's a very clever negotiator and we talk about some of the tactics he's used including one that he used to get about 20 percent off of the purchase of his property after he had tied it up conditionally so he used the tactic that i've talked about before on the show where you tie up a property conditional on inspection and then find things that are wrong with it quantify it and reason with the seller as to why you're going to need to get the property for less so ross did a masterful job of that and he shared that story here it was really a grand slam type of deal and he's a really inspiring guy to listen to and follow so uh, i was really grateful that he came on the show and i think you're going to enjoy it too uh, once again Again, if you're a new investor and you just want to follow along as I run through the numbers on these episodes, I am generally always using my spreadsheet that I created to analyze cash flow. So if you want to grab a copy of that, you can just go to andrew-hines.com. You'll see the, the box to enter your information and have that emailed to you. Without further ado, please enjoy episode 133 with Ross Nadai. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Ross Nadai on the show, been practicing that. And uh, Ross, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew, for having me. It's uh, an absolute honor to be here. Um, I've been listening to podcasts for years, and you're one of the reasons I actually got into real estate investing. So uh, thank you for putting a great show. And it's actually an inspiration for me to also start my own podcast because of this reason. So I'm so glad to be here today. Awesome. Yeah, well, I haven't had a chance to, to listen to your podcast yet, but I've seen people share it a lot. So you must be doing a good job. And um, why don't you just kind of break it down for me? Because I don't know your story. Sure. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this won't have heard your story before. So uh, let me have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a little bit about myself, my background. I, um, I'm, uh, I come from Afghanistan, as you know, it's a war torn country. So your typical immig immigrant story, I guess you can say. So parents came here with three kids, no, barely any money. Uh, the whole focus was on me getting educated and, you know, building a lifestyle that uh, will be beneficial for me and for my siblings. So I was in the whole mindset, like everyone else, like get educated, go get a co co corporate job and then retire 65. And then you're, you made it basically. Right. Uh, after graduating, I realized that's not the case. You know, corporate jobs are phenomenal. They're great to get experience and learn, but it's not everything. Right. right. Especially if the lifestyle you want, you have to find other means. So I, I, I came across basically real estate investing, I would say around 2013, uh, I graduated. Uh, one of my friends actually, he told me about this condo project that was happening. It was like $500 a month. And I couldn't believe what I heard, right? I was like, what are you talking about? Like you pay $500, how much is the down payment? It's like $2,500. I'm like, okay, I can afford that. I had just graduated, I was making, you know, $40,000 salary. So I figured it's, not, it's a no brainer. Um, so that's kind of how I started, but that project took about seven years to wrap up. It was a very long project. I mean, I did well at the end of it, but uh, at that time I didn't know better, right? I thought it was oh, this too is, slow, right? It was way too slow. Yeah, pre-construction takes a really long time. Expect delays. I was, I was always advised that to clients. Now that I'm a realtor, I, I try to stay away from those personally, unless somebody's really keen on, the, you know, waiting for that period of time. You can definitely get really wealthy, and my buddy did that. He got really wealthy. He started his whole his whole journey really with with the pre construction, mm -hmm. but I think that that's more on the gambling side of things. As you are speculating, a lot of people who buy into pre co they don't have any aspirations of cash flow. It's really just a matter of well, if I buy it now, it'll hopefully it'll be worth more by the time I close. Absolutely, uh, which is fine for a certain percentage of your portfolio, but it is speculating, right? I mean, we all dedicate a little bit of money to the casino sometimes, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know for sure. But at that time, my, my mentality was, let me just get in, right? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm like, I want to play, I want potentially we're going to need a place to live when I graduate, right? So I'm like, you know what, let's do it. It's a no brainer. Um, but at that time, again, I had no idea, right? How things worked, what financial freedom looked like, how you can leverage money and all that. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons that I got into this whole thing was after reading Rich Dad and Poor Dad, the classic. And of course, I was searching through a lot of personal finance information. I was always been keen on that. And uh, I came across uh, a podcast, you know, uh, yourself before yours, I actually came across Bigger Pockets as the most popular one. 
And then I was like, you know what? This is great content. I need some Canadian content, something that's more applicable, like the T5 uh, exchange, I believe is what it's called. It's not applicable here. There were certain things that were a little bit different. Oh, yeah. I know the one you're talking about. The T20 exchange, I believe it's called? No, it's... Uh, it's like a tax 31, 31 exchange. I can't remember. Yeah, 31 exchange, something 31 exchange. I, I would know this if we hadn't uh, hadn't just scrambled it in my brain. But uh, no, that's OK. Keep going. Yeah, no worries. No worries. So that's when I, you know, I, I came across a couple other podcasts and I heard you actually another podcast. And I'm like, wow, this this guy sounds very genuine. And uh, the sign I, I tuned into yours listen to every single episode and I actually reached out to you, I don't know if you remember back in maybe two years or so, asking a little bit about the student rental market in London, Ontario. And we, we talked briefly, but long story short, that's kind of how my journey started. I, I thought I found out how cash flow works, what to look for, how to analyze, use your calculator religiously till this day. Um, and then I decided to why not combine sales and real estate at the same time? Because I by profession right now, uh, I work in sales. And I figured, you what, know what? What business? Uh, I do software sales. So I'm software an account sales? manager. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I decided to get my realtor license because I'm like, this is something I'm in for a long haul. So why not learn it, implement it first, and then teach on the passing to other folks that, and help clients out as well. So and that's what I've been doing so far. Yeah, that's actually something I've thought of for a long time about getting the realtor license. Yeah. Still haven't. I mean, I haven't found it necessary yet, but it's it's not so much necessary as it is a potential opportunity that I'm not taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would actually give me a, an opportunity to work with a lot more people that want to connect with me in a way that's kind of mutually beneficial. So. Uh, definitely something on my radar, but I mean, that's a big commitment now, right? There's a, there's quite the process to even getting getting your realtor license at this point, is there not? Yeah, they changed it up. Uh, it's more, um, I guess, oriented in terms of classroom settings versus before it was more correspondence. Uh, but in the long run, I think it's beneficial for, for everybody because they will actually learn what to do versus just kind of reading on your own and doing right. exams. So is it pretty much a year process? Like, I'm just genuinely curious at this point. I have a friend who's going through it herself, and she mentioned they're doing more of a like 40 hour a week per course uh, setting. So depending on your schedule, I guess, if you really want to get it done, you could probably get it done on a three months still, right? It's oh, OK, so you just got to get into the schedule, get into Correct. the course, study hard, and then. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you can shut off the rest of life and what's going <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah, for sure. Um, OK, so you're in software sales. I'm guessing you graduated for something tech related or was Not it at all. No, no, no. I actually went. Uh, uh, my background was HR, human resources, and uh, started in insurance. From insurance, I went to HR. I did, you know, recruitment. I did the opposite side, which is the account management side. And at that point in my life, I, I, I said to myself, I hate this. this is, I'm never going to do sales ever again. And today I'm back in sales, funny enough, uh, because I think it really depends on the opportunity and which company you, you work for that really highlights and then helps you because I've been very successful in my current company. Uh, I've won like three CEO sales clubs and so do you, forth. Do you like the product? I do. Actually, it's funny. I'm sure we all use it. QuickBooks. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great product. Oh, man. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, that, the key thing here is how do I get a better affiliate commission? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. So QuickBooks is super useful. I, I think it's that's the big thing with sales. I think if you're selling something you like, you don't feel like you're selling. That's right. And um, you know, generally speaking, I don't want to sell anybody on anything. I mean, if they like something, if I can transpose my enthusiasm onto them and they want it, cool. Um, that's that's really the, uh, the be all and end all of sales. I think. So anyway, so you're in the business. I think if you like real estate, especially as an investor, it makes so much sense. Uh, it's not going to make sense for everybody, but for, for guys like yourself to go in and focus on dealing with people who want to do the type of investments you do. Because yeah. uh, then you can speak with conviction. Hey, this is how I do it. Uh, I, I've been back and forth on it. Do I want the realtor that invests in exactly what I do? Yeah. Or do I want them to just understand it? Or do I want them not involved at all? I don't think not involved at all works because they don't get it. Uh, but if they're an investor and they just have a different flavor, that can work. Um, and then if they do the same thing as you, then they're stealing your business. So <laughs> it's somewhere in the middle of all that. <laughs> yeah, but we can't all buy all, yeah. everything in the market. Can't buy That's everything, right? Thing. You might have three projects on the go. And say, well, right. I can't, I can't do any more. Yeah, exactly. I can't do any more right now. But these three are going to get by me. Do you want to buy them? Exactly. And I've had uh, that's the scenario I've described plenty with uh, the realtor I've worked with over the years. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's how I analyze it too. Like right now, I'm, I'm, I'm fully booked. I don't have any more uh, room for any new projects. I have a few on the go. So 
clients of mine, I come across anything, of course, like I, I make sure that they're well, well aware yeah. of it. And if it makes sense, I crunch the numbers even for them to make it easier. So what type of investments are you in? For me, uh, I'm in multifamily. So I uh, started with the condo, as I mentioned, and then it transitioned into multifamily. So currently I'm sitting at a portfolio of about 20 units, um, primarily of uh, all multifamily. So I own a couple of duplexes, triplexes and so forth. Uh, Where? Uh, mainly Niagara region. Yeah, so I'm heavily invested in Niagara. I have a few in Sarnia as well that I'm wrapping up. Uh, but the reason I went kind of on the outskirts uh, to the Sarnia market was because the deal was too good to pass on. And yeah. it was a little uncomfortable, right? Because we, we kind of want to be close. And yeah. uh, so I, at this point, I'm self-managing. So it was a little bit of a you know, ballsy move for, on my part, but I, the numbers yeah. made sense and there was no reason to pass on. So what's the most recent you know, notable purchase for you? The most uh, recent one, I would say, uh, was the one that I closed with a JV partner. Uh, we got it in uh, St. Catharines. Uh, it was uh, a duplex that we got, uh, I think it was in month of April, I believe. Okay. Yeah. What'd you buy? You said duplex, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So duplex, Niagara region. What, what were you into for cost there? So is this the one you want to analyze or should we do another one? We can do, we okay. can do multiple here. There's, okay. no, there's, no, no. there's no set rules to this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. The reason why I say it is because I actually had a full refinance Burr one, the one I wanted to talk about, which okay. was one of my, uh, the ones at yeah. Niagara. So. Okay. Yeah. You want to do that one? Okay. Sure. So you did a, a recent duplex. We've done so many duplexes on this show. Right. Was there anything significant about this that's kind of different from the norm that you've heard on this show? Or was it kind of um, cut and dry, work through the process. Did you get all your money back out of that one? I did. I love you more on top of it. Okay, so this is the one you wanted to talk about. Yeah, right, yeah this well, is the one. So, so like, we're, you want to talk about the Grand Slam. Let's do the Grand Slam, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, let's hear it. What'd you buy it for? Yeah, so this property is a triplex. I, I bought it in uh, Niagara region. Uh, I bought it for 330. Okay. It was listed for 420 and I got it for, for 330. Wow, how'd you do that? Yeah, it, the, the funny thing about this property was that it was in the market for quite some time. I actually looked at it a few times and passed on it because of the way it looks on the outside. Meanwhile, on the inside, it was pretty much all renovated. Um, and two out of the three units were also being presented to uh, vacant. Was this, this was in Niagara Falls proper? Fort Erie. Fort Erie? Okay. Yeah, Fort Erie. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so you, you said how many? Three, three units, right? Three units, looks yeah. really good on the inside, not so good on the outside. Yeah, outside is a little bit rough. It looks like, you know, uh, I would say it's a little cottage. It's a, it's a wood shingle, so it looks really rough on the outside. But again, they did updates on the inside. Yeah. And so, as I mentioned, I looked at it the first time, analyzed it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about the outside, so I'm going to pass on it. A uh, few weeks later, I see it again, and I call the agent. And I'm like, hey, like, can you tell me if this is available? He goes, yeah, it, it is. Uh, we are accepting offers to so like 4 p.m. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to throw in an offer. 400, let's see how it goes. Uh, the agent told me, you know what, they have few on the table. He's going to wait till they get my offer in before he fully presents. But call me back saying, oh, you know what, the seller decided to take whatever. He couldn't wait. So unfortunately, sold conditionally. And I'm like, what's the condition? He's like, based on financing. I'm like, listen, if, if for whatever reason, if it doesn't go through, please make sure to call me. And funny enough, a week after goes, he calls me and he's like, that guy couldn't close. Are you still interested? I'm like, absolutely. So threw in the same offer at 400000 uh, this was prior to me even viewing it. This was just based on right. pictures. So I had an inspection clause in there, of course. So went into the property, checked it out, was su very surprised by the condition of it. There was, you know, a few minor uh, cosmetic renovations that it needed overall. But uh, I was able to get it down, negotiate it around 3.30 because it was an older home. So I that's had a lot not of a ammo. Small, that's <laughs> not a small negotiation. How, how did you get, and this is the perfect scenario because that seller is probably kind of worn down at that point they just want it done yeah. and they're starting to believe that it's a problematic property in their own head that's right so you go in what did you say to get them down from 400 to, to 330. Yeah. good question so first of all I, I understood what the seller motivation was so uh, this gentleman was uh looking to retire he was he was having some health concerns so he just wanted his money and you know move on to better things in life so it was sitting in the market for a while. So I knew I had the ammo in that perspective. And then secondly, when I went in there, I created a list of all the things that were wrong with the property, things that I need to basically renovate. And I presented that to him to say, here's the reason why I came with this number. Here's how much I have to spend to get it to where I want it to be, like, you know, really nice and renovated. 
And most importantly, before doing that, I spoke with, uh, with Sean Rea uh, from Fort Erie, and he was looking at the same property, funny enough, and uh, we we're talking over the phone, and then he, uh, he was like, you know what, Ross, why don't you just throw in 330? What's the worst that can happen? I'm like, all right, let's do it. I did. Yeah. I was ideally looking at 350. So you let the the existing contract expire, or you sent in an amendment to drop amendment. to drop the price down. Correct. Send an amendment. Spoke with the agents. Give them like all removing the list. your condition, dropping the price. That's right. That's and right. And he signed it. <laughs> yeah. I was shocked. He came back to me. He said, "You won't believe this." He actually accepted it. I'm like, "Let's do it." <laughs> oh man. Yeah. And I like Sean's attitude about that because Sean, um, such a nice guy. Yeah not afraid to be a bulldog in a negotiation mm -hmm. and just ask for it and big big believer in that if you don't ask you don't get absolutely sean definitely asks and and definitely gets so yeah uh so definitely doesn't hurt to be uh, following his lead down there yeah okay so uh pretty incredible story so you did have direct conversations or it was mostly through the realtor just explaining the realtor. so you, yeah. you listed it all out said here's what i have to do that's right here's my amendment i mean just getting it tied up and then you know how he's he's invested how many days in the inspection with you was it seven days yeah inspection? it was about seven yeah yeah i mean there's, right. there's such a psychological process to him thinking it's done and then oh it's not i can't mm -hmm. now this is the second one that'll fall through right. uh screw it i just want to be done with it Right. I've been the beneficiary of that situation maybe once <laughs> and got a smoking deal. Um, but uh, that, that's incredible. Great story. So what did you end up putting into it to renovate it? For renovations, I probably put about $25,000. That's it? Did you do the outside? Outside, no. I haven't touched because I, it doesn't really do anything in terms of ROI at this point. But if I ever decide to sell it in the future, then that'll be something I'll look into. Right. Okay. And as far as uh, the units go, you said a couple of them were vacant? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So one was one was occupied. Just one was pre preoccupied, and I was the best part of this was again I was able to set my own rents, get my own tenants in, and uh, again ask market rents, which really helped with the with the cash flow. Do you still have the existing tenant in there? I do. Yeah, one of them is actually moving end of this month. Uh, so again, the benefit of that is I'm gonna get some new tenants in. Like that guy's moving out. The the one that was already in there, or. Oh, I see. Uh, no, the two that were vacant, I got my own tenants in. One of the two that I placed, they're leaving. Oh, okay. okay they're a young yeah. professional couple. So they decided to move back to States. Uh, the gentleman that was upstairs, uh, he ended up leaving. I renovated that property and I'm actually house hacking it now. Okay. So you're living there. Okay. Living for free, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Okay. So you're, you're based in Fort Erie now. Now I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so you're twenty five thousand dollars into the Reno, and then carrying costs uh, would that be inside the twenty five thousand? Yeah, that's okay. what included. Yeah, yeah, and uh, okay, so your purchase and repair is about uh, three hundred fifty five thousand. Mm -hmm. What's your new value on that when you got it appraised? Yeah, so I actually did get this uh, refinance, so uh, the appraisal came about five fourteen. Interesting number. Yeah. Um, okay, so five fourteen. Did you get eighty percent of that? That's right. Yeah. So you got four hundred eleven two hundred. That's right. Okay, so then if we subtract off what you had in, that means you were getting back in your pocket 56000 So we can't even calculate an ROI because you made money on it. Okay, now let's get into the cash flow. So you've got two units that are, are uh, rented. What are they rented at? Sure. So uh, one is 1250 The other one is 1350 Okay, so you're getting about 2600 on the building. Yeah. And prior to move, me moving in, I was getting uh, $1,000 for the upstairs unit. So it was about 3600 at the time. Yeah, let's just work through both of those. So 3600 is the, the rent as it was. What are your taxes on that place? Uh, 2350 for the year. Okay, and then did you... So none of the rentals you needed to do required a permit? No, they so, were all in, so, interior, so... So no reassessment coming. That's a nice thing. Tax reassessments aren't fun. Yeah. Okay, um, insurance, what do you pay on, on uh, About annual? two grand. Okay, and um, maintenance, older building. What do you what do you typically budget? Uh, eight percent. Eight percent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, utilities. Are you paying them? No. So the beauty of this is it comes with three separate hydro meters, three gas meters. So three water meters. No water. Water is the only thing, but I'm kind of splitting between the tenants at this point. So just split evenly? That's right, yeah. As long as none of them have a yard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the key. Uh, okay, so what are you on on the water annually? Uh, I've had this for six months or so. I would say it's probably roughly around 200 a month. So 2,400 for a year. 2,400. Okay. And uh, management, you're self-managing. Mm -hmm. And then landscaping, snow removal. Yeah. Um, it's probably about $50 a month. Oh, that's all? You're getting a deal. 
Okay, so 600 a year for that. I would typically budget a bit more, but if you can get good deals, you can get good deals. Yeah. Um, okay, so I put in 500 for miscellaneous always, just just for what ifs. Um, okay, so we're gonna go with the new value here. You said it was 514. And that works out to be a 6.2% cap rate, so you're doing well there. Now your mortgage, you said 80% on a 30 year end? 30 year, yeah. Okay, perfect. Interest rate, two. Two even? Mm -hmm. Okay, 2% interest rate. So your payment's about 15, 18 a month ish. Yeah. Sound about right? That's right, yeah. Uh, and your cash flow on that looks to be about 1139. So not bad, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like the sounds of Fort Erie. Yeah. Is, is, is it still a place that you can get a deal done? Not anymore. Not 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 at this cap rate. Definitely not. No. But yeah, there there are some hidden gems that come in the market here and there. Uh, but you, again, you have to make sure you really got to know your market and, and know what you can do with it. And yeah, I mean that, that that's really been the what's happened over the last sixteen months. Is it's yeah. it's just changed the way people look at properties. It's flooded the market with a lot of extra cash too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that's a pretty smoking deal. Um, now let's just adjust it. If we were to, to go down to the 2600 and now you live for free, mm -hmm. you're still getting 200 bucks cash flow and not paying anything to live. Exactly. So that's that's the real benefit right there. It's, yeah. a, it's a perfect house hack. Right. You got no money into it and you're you're uh, living for free. Perfect. Okay, so what what are you looking for now? Like I know you said you're kind of capped out. Why are you capped out? Uh, just finishing up some of the renovations, as I mentioned, uh, the two um, properties that I purchased in Sarnia are basically done. Two units still need to be converted over. I'm, I'm looking to get some tenants in today, actually. Okay. Uh, What's the property in Sarnia? The Sarnia I purchased, uh, it, one is a triplex. Actually, both of them are triplex. Um, one of them, I, it's registered as a single family. I have to go to the, the city to get it uh, converted um, into a legal triplex and their records, but it's being used as a triplex currently. So they have a, a long-standing record of it being used as a triplex? Yeah, I believe so. The owner converted that maybe at least three years ago, I would say. Oh, that's not typically long-standing enough. Not enough? <laughs> no. So, I mean, I don't know how it works in every city, but in yeah. London, it was like you had to go back to 1972. Oh, and then wow. You, then once every ten, 10 years, so you got to go into the library, the public library downtown, and get the phone book records. So they actually have like a record of how many units were registered in that unit mm -hmm. like every year so you go through the old phone records find out how many phone phones there were and then they want one other form of confirmation so you can look at the tax roll um, I believe this is still the case so if you could provide that and show continuous use so you know 1972 1982 1992 2002 2012 right. if you can show that consistent use then they'll grandfather you in and they'll, they'll give you you know legal status as a as whatever it is right so right. that can that can actually work out really well i should look but into that but it's a lot of work yeah so every city's a little bit different though they might not have that requirement right um, right i don't know where you stand on this but to me like as long as if i have a plan a to use a unit illegally and my plan b is still okay like like say oh i can sneak a couple extra bedrooms here that aren't legal but uh you know it doesn't matter. I don't have to put in a big investment to make those happen. Right. Even if I go only a year out of it, I'm happy until I get shut down or something like that. I'd be okay with that. Is that is that how you approach it? Absolutely, Andrew. So let me tell you a little bit about this, the, these two purchases and why I made it. As I mentioned to you, there were, I couldn't I couldn't pass on it, uh, these deals. So I was this is uh, this was around December, right? So I, I had closed on the fourth area in November, mm -hmm. and this was just right after. So again, before this. I was pleasantly surprised that I had the cap space to go purchase another property because my mindset at the time was you, you purchase one or two, you're done, right? Yeah. You got to come up with the money and the funds and so forth. I didn't know about refinancing and everything, right? So anyway, uh, this is during COVID and uh, my wife and I actually had COVID at that time. So I'm locked in, I'm in my room and what do I do? I'm like analyzing deals left, right and center. So I, this comes across my desk around maybe 6 p.m. on a Friday. I look at it and it was like over exceeding 1% rule. And I immediately called the agent, threw on an offer, locked it in, put myself on a 14 day condition. I didn't say how I had COVID because they would have rejected it. Um, you know, I did say I need to do my inspection and financing was the clause. They accepted it. So I locked it in. One was listed for 190. Uh, very good condition. The outside is good. The inside is good. This is the one that's, that's uh, currently as a single family, but I could be easily converted to triplex. The other one is a legal duplex with the city. The basement is the only one that's not being used as a you know legal unit. 
that one was listed for 170 at that time. So 190, 170, right beside each other, basically. Um, so again, I saw that and I'm like, okay, like if, if I look at the mortgage at 20% down, it's around $500 a month. I can afford that no matter what it costs. Yeah. Right. So it's just a no brainer for you, even though you didn't That's have right. a team set up there. Yeah. It was one of those things where I, before I even have a team in place, it was more like, Hey, I knew somewhat about Sarnia cause I did connect with some folks in the area, um, prior to that, but I wasn't thinking of investing there, but then the deal came across my table and I couldn't say no. So locked it in, uh, as is it already cash flowed by the way, as well. So. It was, so it was all tenanted. occupied. All occupied. It was so you had tenanted. five units or six units. So occupied. six units. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. So you're you're laughing. Six units occupied. Yeah. Waiting for them to turn over. Examining your options with the city as to what you can do. Mm -hmm. But even if you have to go back to a single family, are they not still a decent investment? Yeah, they're probably almost one percent rule as as single families. Yeah, I would say that I don't think it would be an issue in terms of getting converted the single family one, just because like it's the way it's structured. Each unit is, has its own entrances, everything. I don't think it would be yeah. too much pushback. Well, have you looked at zoning yet, though? Zoning allows. So for the it. zoning allows for it. Yes. Um, yes. So it's really just a matter of of actually getting it inspected. Correct. And it's fire so, coded and so forth. That's yeah. So they want to get you know pull a permit, mm -hmm. make sure your fire fire code everything up up to date. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so if you can do that, you can potentially get legal status. Now, have they told you that they're going to want you to pay a development charge to go from a single unit to two units to three units or anything like that? Nothing so far. We're in the midst of the, the application. So right now, we're just uh, they got the drawings, everything in. Uh, they're just asking us to kind of draw and lay out the, the parking is, yeah. is from what I heard the last uh, update I got. Uh, that's pretty much it from my understanding. Uh, but let's see how it goes, I'm hoping. Okay, so you've got a, are, are you thinking you're going to need a minor variance or you're, it's fully conforming? I believe it's fully conforming at this point. Yeah. If your parking maybe isn't quite enough, then they might say, okay, go Correct. get a minor variance and get that approved. Here's the key question is what do you do if they say no, right? Like, no, you can't. Are you doing it on the single family to go to a triplex first? So that's the one. Yeah. Or are you doing both at the same time? So the other one, again, it's, it's a, it's a legal duplex. I'm going to keep it as legal, legal duplex because the, uh, height ceiling, the, oh, okay. So the basement's not, not the basement not, height is not right not quite there. So we have to dig out and, and do all that. And which is not worth it. Right. Yeah. It's, I feel like digging out is one of those things that's so expensive that it only really makes sense if you're doing it in a place where land is so, you know, expensive right. that it's, it, it's warrants putting a hundred grand into digging a basement down. So for you, would you say that this is a more of a peace of mind, um, approach you're, you're doing this renovation for the peace of mind, or are you doing it to create the perceived value if you ever were to sell this property or if you ever ha were to have it reappraised? Yeah, I would say it's, it's a combination of both. Uh, I mean, ideally I would want to get it appraised as a, as a trap blacks when I refinance versus a single family, right? It will help with the value. And then most importantly, like you said, peace of mind, last thing I want is a city coming knocking on my door and saying, you got to shut this down. So, yeah. Yeah, that's not a that's not a call I would want. Um, are they doing rental licenses in Sarnia yet? No, no. Is that like a discussion point or not even close? From my from my understanding, it's a small town. They're not really looking yeah. into that. Uh, and a majority of the properties, if you do buy, are kind of people just did whatever they wanted without the city involvement. Uh, so they're pretty lenient, I would say. Well, it's a similar situation in, in Hamilton. Like if they were to come in and do rental license, all of a sudden, like seventy percent of the rentals out there are going to become illegal. Oh. illegal. Guaranteed. Yeah. There's like a business in Hamilton of, of illegal rentals. Like I know many people who've come on this podcast do the thing where you get the, the old, you know, century home mm -hmm. that's two and a half stories. You legally do it as two units and then they just add two more units in after the inspector closes the permit. <laughs> like that's a standard thing. Wow. Um, you know, and, and I look at it, I'm like, wow, like you're really into like you're, you're like 100,000, 200,000, you know, call it 100,000 plus right. into adding illegal units. Mm -hmm. So that's the level of confidence investors seem to have yeah. in Hamilton to add in illegal units. For me, my comfort zone, man, that doesn't, <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know about that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Like maybe I need to loosen up a little bit on that though. But uh, yeah, no, my plan is not to keep it legal, right? Like I said, if I, I would like, love to have it legalized, so then I don't have to worry about that. And I think it's, the chances are it's going to go through uh, yeah. fairly well. So. But there are people like including yeah. uh, a guy, uh, one of my contractors that his entire portfolio is filled with illegal units. Like he buys them intentionally with the intent to do this, all this stuff without permits. And, right. you know, he's at probably like $50,000 a month of cash flow or something like something wow. silly, like just a ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not worried. I mean, yeah. but I mean, he, things could change in a blink of an eye. Really. All it would take right. is the wrong 
uh, the wrong person. So this is why I don't ever recommend that to anyone listening, watching. Um, yeah. y- you got to do what you're comfortable with, but there's definitely a risk involved Absolutely. in that. Yeah, you got to uh, look at your risk tolerance. I uh, there are even like, again, as a realtor, I'm always looking at properties that came across a current one. Yeah. Um, I showed a client, same thing. We had a conversation. It's it's a duplex, legal duplex, but yeah. you use it as a triplex. And, you know, they they, they uh, raise a concern about it. You know, what happens if the tenant of the basement is kicked out? Then it doesn't necessarily cash flow as well, right? As so well, yeah. what do we do in that instance? And it's totally fair. It's a fair concern. And I'm glad we, we talked about it because then the numbers don't make sense if we were to remove that end, right? So yeah, definitely I do, look into that. I don't know if you get it, but I get it a fair bit of people asking me, Andrew, you know, what do you think of this? Or should I do this? Is this normal? Is this a good idea? I'm like, well, every time I'm going to answer that, it's going to start with it depends. <laughs> <laughs> depends on you, right? Like, should totally. I invest in, you know, pre-construction? Well, maybe if you've got 100 cash flowing properties and, and absolutely don't care if you have a dog and you just say, ah, I want to throw a little bit of money over to that and see how it does. Yeah. I mean, for some people that that makes total sense. But if you have no properties and you're saying, should I buy a pre-construction as my first investment? Mm-hmm. I think you and I would both agree that that's probably not we're not right for anyone in that situation, especially in today's market and the yeah. prices. Definitely not very, very hard to get in unless you're making, you know, two million plus a year from your job and just have no time and you're like well i can throw a little bit there and even if it turns out to be a dog or loses you don't care right right yeah so anyway so what what's your philosophy now when you're when you're looking for properties for clients well first off how much of of your time is is being a realtor right now is this like a big focus for you or is this sort of just like a a side thing yeah no for sure like uh what i love about my current job is especially with you know the whole pandemic i work from home so i can definitely focus on on both ends of the spectrum you can say so uh my weekends are fully booked with clients like it's uh one of the reasons I moved to Fort Erie was for that reason, because I used to live in Toronto and I had to do the whole commute back and forth every weekend. Yeah, sounds terrible. So I was like, you know what, let me get into the city because I, I, my focus is in Niagara um, and I'm helping clients in the Niagara region. So now that's literally cut in 20 minutes of a commute time. Um, so, you're, so I can focus are, are more. you primarily in Fort Erie or you're in Niagara Falls? Like what what's where do you find your investors, your clients wanting most? Sure. So they're pretty open to any anywhere that makes sense. And what I like about the Niagara region is, although there's different little, uh, I guess, s- towns or cities, you want to call it, uh, they all have a, a, their own unique opportunities. So you can still find deals in St. Catharines. You can still find deals in Welland yeah. and uh, Niagara Falls, Port Colborne, even uh, in Fort Erie. So like everything is around 20 minute drive proximity. So it's not too hectic yeah. to get around. Uh, But again, it all depends on the person's risk tolerance. How much renovations are they willing to do? Do they want a full gut job or do they want to do a few cosmetics? So depending on your appetite, then I can go and hunt for the solution. Do you have a good good team built up down there in Fort Erie now, like renovators, um, contractors, all that stuff? Yeah, Uh, I'm constantly uh, consistently looking into building that, uh, you know, team. I do have a few uh, folks that I'm working with very closely. So I, you know, I do recommend those to clients as well because they're always looking for for connections, right? So yeah, that's the, the tricky part, right? But I mean, I think it's one of those things where you just got to start. You just got to start going. Right. Like you're going to say, oh, I don't have the right team there. You can find them. You can always find them. I mean, there was a point where I was at where I was just, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but the hire and fire thing, like you're just constantly firing people until all of a sudden you get one that, is great and they happen to know a whole bunch of other people that are great and Absolutely. all of a sudden you're, you're rolling right absolutely yeah the funny you mentioned that i i went through the whole uh similar situation as well but although i asked for folks for the recommendation these guys are the good ones that are taken like you can't find yeah them. Like fully no booked. investor is going to say here's my contractor go go tie them right. up so that i can't use them anymore that's the main problem right like that's right you'll easily find people share a property manager because it's not a big deal to add in you know extra extra property to their portfolio but finding their renovator or their you know their key <laughs> contractor yeah that's a little tougher yeah yeah so i went through uh basically that the search i i uh went through uh the phone book, I guess you can say, called a few folks, I hired one contractor for that renovation for the upstairs unit I was telling you about. Um, they quoted me, they seemed fine. Uh, they came in with a team and, you know, I, I always ask for updates as they're doing uh, progressions and whatnot. First of all, they had no phone number, so I couldn't contact the person on site. It was only the office. So imagine calling the receptionist, the receptionist like every day asking, hey, can I get a, can I get an update? What's going on? What's happening? Secondly, it was all through email. And then lastly, they would send me a few pictures here and there. And then often not, I went there personally myself to just check and inspect. 
and their work was just horrendous man oh my god it was just so bad like they they it was just very sloppy let's put it that way so i had to pay another handyman to clean up after them to just make things right and uh basically end up firing them like you said and uh yeah i, I did uh, lose a little bit of money but i learned a lot right because at that point in time even if i the money that i lost still made it worthwhile yeah and this is where it... <laughs> I've been accused of being cynical and I don't mean to be, but I just right. don't, I don't expect much when I start with somebody new. Like I, yeah. for me to think that I have this vision of what I want my house to turn into and I expect someone to come in and do that mm -hmm. and to do a great job of it and do it at a reasonable price, it almost feels like I'm asking too much. <laughs> Am I? I? I don't know. <laughs> this is why I got into being my own contractor because I didn't want to deal with that. Right. But you're hiring GCs, right? That's right. So what kind of what's the agreement do you have a scope of work how detailed is it have they listed every material they're going to use yeah um, and how were you able to salvage the situation i'm assuming you gave them some level of a deposit even if it was a small one yes yes and so you've paid them x amount of money did you lose money on your contract had you overpaid them at that point i lost the deposit i guess you can say um i mean they, they did majority of the renovations i would say there, there was like 90 percent complete Again, it was just sloppy that I didn't want them to finish yeah. the rest of it. Um, I did, I guess, contract a few things out. Like I had a tile guy myself because I, I, uh, I knew he was really good and he did a phenomenal job. So things that they were responsible for was like installing a new countertop, getting rid of like some of the laughing plaster that was in the ceiling. I hired out yeah. my own uh, electrician for the pod light. So a few things here and there. I built a, cl uh, a closet in the unit. Um, and yeah, did you, they just, things didn't go too well. Did they give you an itemized price? Like this part of they the job did. is this. So you could easily say, well, you didn't do that. So I, uh, they were taking that off yeah. the price. The thing is they did it. They yeah. just didn't do a good job. They didn't do a good <laughs> and, so. and again, like how do you see this is, this is the problem is yeah. like, if you really want to get a detailed scope of work, you would have pictures of the way it needs to look with like specific, like annotations saying, see how there's no gap in the trim here. This is what I expect. <laughs> like. And it was, it'd be worth building that. It really would. You want to see how many emails I sent and pictures? I did exactly that. Like little errors, little marks. But you did it after the fact. So I'm saying yeah. if you did it ahead of time and you showed them this book, like here are my expectations, standards right. of quality. If you can't meet this, don't take the job. Yeah. Because I won't pay unless you do. And then right. I'll, it, it's super worth it. I'm just not, uh, well, sorry, it seems like it might be super worth it until you realize how much time it takes to create that manual. It does, so, it does. So what do you do, right? I mean, I think, Going through a video, mm -hmm. this is probably the best compromise, is you, you date a video, upload it to YouTube of you doing a walkthrough through a house and pointing out specific things and what's not acceptable and what is. Right. And then you get them to agree right in the contract that they've watched that video and the specific points of you explaining what is acceptable and what is not. Yeah. And that they wouldn't be paid if it was, if it was the unacceptable. Yeah. And I think if you had something like that, then it would not take you too much time but it would allow you to, uh, you know, get on a reasonable communication level with that contractor. I totally agree. I th because, I, again, I was under the impression that, you know, yeah, you're paying somebody who is a contractor, who is a professional, they're going to do the, the job properly. And then that wasn't the case. So that, that generally is not right. That's I think, right. you that's know, right. 80, 20, I think it's more 90, 10, um, 90 percent are not going to be satisfactory. The 10 percent right. that are are the ones that aren't generally not always generally are not advertising. They're not found on Kijiji or Facebook marketplace. They're right. they're busy working. That's right. They're fully booked. and they're they're yeah. getting referrals like crazy because they do a good job. That's right. So not to say you can't get good quality out of people from Kijiji because I've built my team off of that. That's right. where it all started. Right. It all started there. Right. <laughs> but I think it takes it takes time. It takes perseverance. And then it also takes a bit of a skill, I think, mm -hmm. of being able to, to talk to people, reason with them and try right. and get the best out of them. Like, Absolutely. you know, weed out the chaff, but uh, but make sure that you're you're focusing on the people who show promise and say, hey, I really like how you did this. I really want to focus on, you know, what you're good at. You know, I want to give you jobs that you're good at, that you want to do and, you know, try and try and win them over that way. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a very yeah. good tip. <laughs> Not to go rambling on here. I know this is more about you. So if I came to you and right. I said, uh, Ross, I want to put money to work. I want to burr. I want to get that money back. I want to acquire a lot of units. Mm hmm. Where do you start with me? Depends on your goal. What is that number for you? How comfortable are you with leaving some money on the table? Because it's not always going to be a perfect burr each time, right? It doesn't need to be a perfect burr. But say I wanted to just keep moving. 
Um, right. You know, what's a not perfect burr? Like, are you, do you have five plexes that you see come available, 10 plexes, or is it purely just the small stuff, the singles, duplexes, triplexes? I would say primarily in the market, you, you see a lot of duplex, triplexes. Uh, for, there's very few fourplexes and uh, above uh, on that region. But uh, I would say it depends on your appetite, right? Because are you comfortable with assuming tenants? Are you okay with natural turnover? Are you okay with taking on, you know, a property that looks very promising, but you know in the long run you're going to make money, but you may you not have to work with the tenants. Correct, right? You have to do something on the side to make make it your worthwhile. Yeah. Are they typically like if you were to find something, it's going to have tenants that are mid lease, or are they month to month at that point? Majority will be month to month because if they're long term, they automatically They've already month to month, right? Right. So there's still the 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 chance to get them out with that whole Kyle Ford strategy of you give them the N13 and then you go back and try and negotiate with them once they've moved out. Yeah, um, I mean, you to could. To stay away, basically, to sign the N9, right? Yeah, yeah. It's It, it really depends because there's some folks there then they, and they know they're sitting there, they're paying like $500 for like a two-bedroom unit and they know that if they leave, they can't find anywhere else. So you may be stuck with some folks that are lifers. So you yeah. have to be okay with that as well because they're not going to leave. Well, see, and that's okay on like a... 10 unit building if one or two stay. Right, right. But if you're in a triplex and you got one or two, then you got a real problem. That's the thing, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a, the, uh, the thing I have to find out about you because again, yeah, we could do, you could always do cash for keys. You can discuss that. But if well, worst case, not perfect, yeah. worst case, are you okay with sitting on this for you know, X amount of well, time? Well, the other possibility is to actually do it, but how you know, there's only so many of you is to actually move in. Right. <laughs> if, if you tried all else and you absolutely need that man or woman to leave, right. then you could you could move in. Give them notice and move in. That's right. That's right. Not many people, I think, actually rely on that because no one wants to actually move in. You know what? I love that. I love that you brought that up, Andrew, because everybody like sees all this, um, you know, social media posts, the perfect burr, and they think it's that easy. Right. So a lot of my clients come in the depression they're thinking, oh, my God, I need a perfect burr and they don't realize well, the expectations has, are sky high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That so much has changed. So that one of the questions that I brought up earlier was, is like, are you comfortable leaving, let's say, at least your down payment on the line, right? Maybe even after refinancing, you may not be able to recoup everything the first time. Right. Right. So if, if you're looking at a long term, you can refinance multiple times over the years. Appreciation takes down. Right. Paid down, yeah. I think, right? I think the big thing is getting name on real estate. Correct. That's that's the biggest thing. Uh, doing it in a way that that meets operational capacity, mm -hmm. um, you know, not getting anything you know too crazy, not getting uh, too bogged down with massive renovations for very low yeah. equity gain. That's right. right. That's why I think the bigger the bigger projects make more sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a ten unit building plus is starting to make a lot more sense to put that effort into. Right. Right. Yeah. So so by all means, if you got some some ten uniters, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you let me know. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it, it obviously takes a strategy. You can't you can't go into any of these properties and not know what your plan is to get to get money back out. But I agree with you. It's going to be harder. But in fairness, mm -hmm. the perfect burr was never easy. No, it, it was. Here's what was happening. A lot of people were getting the perfect burr because the market went up from when they bought the property to when they actually refinanced it. That's what changed. It wasn't that they were rocket scientists and just knew how to do it or it was just so much easier then. Yeah. it was just that all along, I'd say for the last what five years, people have been saying, how, how can properties continue to go up like this? Right. Yet right. they continue to. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> keep questioning how, but they just keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what was saving a lot of people is their properties and myself included. That's some right. of the stuff I've done. But unless you have had a specific niche, I don't think you were actually, mm -hmm. um, you were actually getting perfect burrs. You were just getting lucky. Um, appreciation factor, which is okay. Yeah. I mean, ride that wave. If you knew you had cash flow, um, you know that's the gamble we take in this business, and it tends to pay off. As long as the cash flow is there, you can gamble on the rest. Absolutely, and that's the thing. For my criteria is cash flow. Yeah. I like appreciation is just cherry on top. I don't focus on that. If if I get it, fantastic. But you know, you have to be able to ride the wave, like we're talking about. Let's just say hypothetically something happens in the market, and then there's a market correction. Yeah. Everything drops down ten percent. Or interest rates increase. If you don't have the buffer, that cushion in your cash flow, how are you going to get through this? Right? Imagine you have 10, 20 properties on the same boat. Oh, yeah. Right? You're screwed. Like, totally screwed. You either have to offload them or you got to figure something else. Right? So, cash flow for me is absolute must because that gives me that the flexibility and that, and that cushion in case anything were to go down. And one more comment I wanted to make is especially with folks that do come to me is like, they're new, they're fairly new, which I totally understand. But I think the key component in anything, especially, and I, I'm sure you can agree with this, is that you got to be focused on one specific strategy. 
I have too many people coming in asking for multifamily and then they're asking, sending me listings. How, what do you think of this for Airbnb? What do you think of this for a uh, short-term rental, long-term rental? Right? It's just, you got to focus. Well, what, what, what about this one? Can I do a duplex conversion? Right? It's like you went from wanting to do $20,000 worth of renovations to now $120,000 renovation, completely different ballgame. Yeah. So just refining what, what it is that they actually want to do. I think yeah. a lot of people are just, you know, trigger happy. They want to get going. Because, I mean, how many people come on this show and say, take action, get started? Oh, for sure. No, and and you do need to. You do need to take action at some point. But yeah, definitely got to be clear on your strategy, which I think even more so comes comes to just taking a step back and saying, realistically, what is your goal? Right. Like, are you just trying to build net worth so that you can keep your job? Or are you trying to quit your job and you know you want to be out in two years? Right. Those two answers would dictate entirely different strategies which I'm assuming you kind of get into with, with what you do. Okay, you Absolutely. want some cash flow, let's support your, your job, and then eventually you can transition in five years. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to make that happen, I think, uh, without getting too crazy. I think that in five-year time frame, a lot of people could still work their full-time job and get out of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's no reason for you to quit a, unless you absolutely hate it. Because as you know, for mortgage purposes, like it's it's a no-brainer. Well, it's really handy, right? So Very. I think that that's why it's a good idea to keep that, start your own company that pays you dividends. When you know, doing whatever, you know, whatever trade you're in for you, you can now get realtor companies, right? That's right. Yeah. So your realtor company can pay you dividends. So that's cool. Um, and then you build up a track record and that replaces your income from the bank. So now that the, now the bank will uh, look at you as almost like you're employed. You just got to show consistency in your dividends. Right. That's right. Yeah. They look at two years. Right. So you got to build that credibility. Or you can pay yourself a salary. But I don't know too many people that do that. It seems like yeah. most people want to do the uh, the dividend. That's right. That's right. Because otherwise you got to do source deductions for like payroll. Uh, what, what is it? CPP and all that junk. Yeah, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it gets complicated. Not necessary. Yeah. Um, OK, so Ross. Thoughts, like wisdom, I mean, first off, how long have you been doing this? Like, I know you said the pre-construction was like quite a few years back, but yeah, yeah. how long have you been an active so, investor? Active investor, multifamily, I would say since November of 2020. So I've been in this fairly new, uh, hasn't even been a year So yet. at November 2020, how many units did you have? I had one. So you went from one to 20? That's right. And is it primarily JV? No, just one JV, the rest are all solely owned. Okay, so you had some money saved up when you started, or did you just get really good with the burrs? Yeah, so the first one, uh, again, was pre-construction. The second was a multifamily that I got, which I burred. Uh, from that point on, I had some uh, money saved up for other down payments for the other yeah. properties. Uh, again, purchase prices were really, really low, so down payments weren't too significant. Um, and again, it's just the whole leverage thing. Take the money from here, put it here. Put the money from here, put it here, right? Like yeah. as your income is coming in, you got to just keep moving the money. Right, and, and you've primarily been in the Niagara region, so there was cash flow. That's right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Wow, you've really moved quick, man. Yeah, thank you, you. You said November? November of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we, like 10 months in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm very, I'm very goal-oriented and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's funny. Last year, I was sitting on my birthday in my condo. I actually, there's a picture. I got to post that. Uh, I sat down, I took my journal and literally wrote, this, these are the goals I got I to gotta accomplish yeah. for this year. And uh, one of them was being on the show. So you're in oh, today. Oh, nice. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> what, uh, do you mind sharing like oh, overall for sure. goals? Yeah, what, what were your goals? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the biggest things is, again, uh, creating my uh, presence in the social media game. I've been falling off that a little bit, but I think it's very important uh, just because if, if you don't showcase what you're doing, then people don't know about you, right? So that's definitely important. Secondly, helping folks out. I've been able to help about five clients so far get into the cash flow business, right? So. I want to give back. I think it feels good giving back to, to the community. And uh, I got that information from other folks. I'm now passing on to yeah. others. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to do was, was grow with my portfolio because I want to get to a point in my life where, you know, I can quit my nine to five job and I can do real estate investing and realtor on, on a full time basis. So I'm pro progressing towards that. I'm not qu there quite yeah. there yet, but uh, projects are moving along. Acquisition, I surpassed. I was. I was looking at 15, now I'm at 20, right? So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's just you just have to keep going. And I think action taking is the biggest thing for sure. Well, yeah. And there's, like you said, there's no need to be in a rush to quit your job, especially if you like it. Yeah. You know, if you like what you're doing, that's that's such a huge win because your right. job's an asset for you. Absolutely. Definitely plan your plan your strategy well before you quit that. <laughs> Make yeah. sure you know how you're going to get your mortgages, how you're going to qualify. And, uh, but it sounds like you're doing a really good job. Sounds like you really critically do think about this. Mm -hmm. um, 
any words of wisdom that you would just want to share, you know, based on your, your 10 months of going aggressive and right. I'm guessing you've been a, a realtor for a similar amount of time? Realtor about two years. Two years, okay. Yeah, but I got really into the whole multifamily sector. Pushed it all at once, years. right? Yeah, Correct. it's easier to, yeah. to, to talk that stuff when you're doing it. Okay, so, That's right. so words of wisdom based on your time in the industry. Yeah, I would say definitely, like I know everybody says this, take action. I mean, we can sit there, analyze spreadsheets all day and be iffy about it, but you're not going to learn anything unless you get into the field, right? Similar uh, to my story earlier, I bought these properties in Niagara. I didn't have a team. I bought these properties, Sonia. I didn't have a team. Did I figure it out? Yes, I did. Yeah. Sink right. or swim, right? Like That's it is. Right. We, I just listened to... Uh, to the audiobook for David Goggins, what's his, uh, can't hurt me. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's such a good lesson, you know, just yeah. people underestimate what they're capable of so badly. It's all like, your limiting beliefs. We all seek comfort. Like right. all of us seek comfort and it's dangerous how much comfort we seek. We, we, we seek comfort in our mind and the things we tell ourselves, like we're doing good enough. We reassure ourselves, oh, it's okay to quit or to not invest more because I don't need to right now. Yeah. Um, and, hey, I'm guilty of this too. We all do it and we all need to uh, to be a little bit more hard on ourselves. I think to your, to your point, it's all about mindset, Andrew. I yeah. think you need to shift that mindset because I, again, I grew up in an environment where it was like, get educated, get started. Debt is bad. Like, don't get yourself in debt. In fact, when I graduated, I, I paid my OSAP off all at once, $30,000. How'd you do that? You saved up? I saved up by working part time, you know, while I was doing full time school, like since I was 15, right? So I made sure that was my biggest, at that time, that was my goal. I want to get out of university debt free. Looking back, this was 2013. Had I invested that $30,000 back in the day, it was 5% down from properties. Yeah. I would have been, uh, I would have been laughing right now. <laughs> yeah. Right, it's, it's it's a shift in mindset you have to make. You have to understand what good debt is and, and what bad debt is, and leveraging money, and it's a change, a game changer. I don't think I'm going to tell my kids to go to university. I mean, of course they'll make their own decision, but yeah. they, my hypothetical kids. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I don't think that I would. I, I think that I will focus more on on educating life skills and. I mean, if I could go back, I think I probably would have just gone. You know, knowing what I know now, if I had right. had that wisdom just got my real estate license and just started rocking it, getting into investments, finding deals. I just don't think there's, you know, there was a better game at the time. Yeah. And uh, probably still isn't now for the average man and woman in Canada to just go out and create wealth. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. But the thing with uh, with going into that is really hard because you're so young, right? Like, think back when you were 18. Did you know what you wanted to do? You were lost. You had nah, no idea what you wanted to do. I was such an idiot at that age. <laughs> <laughs> we all went through that, right? It takes time to learn what you're good at what you want to right, do, yeah. right? So it's, yeah. it's very, very difficult. But I would say, I don't regret going to university. I think it, it was it was great oh, it experience. Was fun. It was yeah. fun. A lot of work. Met a lot of folks, exactly. Yeah. But it challenged me, right? It opened my, my, my perspe perception on life and how to critically think and so forth. But yeah. you're, you're right, in terms of career aspect, if I can just go back and go do my real estate license, who knows where I would be today, yeah. right? Like it'd be a completely different ballgame. Oh yeah, like even right when I finished my um, teaching contract after I graduated in 20, uh, sorry, right after I graduated in 2008, yeah. I could have bought, I didn't even think I could at the time. I didn't know that, that a two-year contract would qualify qualify me for a mortgage. So I didn't try and buy a house. Right. Had I, I could have house hacked because I lived with two roommates from university. There you I go. I could have just lived for free if I had had that common sense. But well, I guess it wasn't common. So if I had that sense to know that, yeah. um, you know, things could have been different. But I don't don't regret my mistakes. And I don't think you do either, right? Like no. you learn from these. They're your lessons okay. and, and they make you wise. So. It's all good. Um, Ross, where do people reach you if they want to follow you? Yeah, uh, I'm very active on social media, so they can find me on Instagram, on Facebook. It's just my first uh, last name, Ross Um And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I do have a podcast. So I'd love to have you on, Andrew. Sure. We'll share your wisdom with, uh, with my audience as well. So Sounds good. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll set that up. And uh, yeah, so they can check your podcast out. What do they just search for yeah. your name? My podcast is uh, named uh, uh, Real Estate Golden Nuggets. Real Estate Golden Nuggets. Okay. So Perfect. Well, we need lots of those gold nuggets. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing this. It was nice to, uh, to finally meet in person. And uh, yeah, I'll look forward to uh, launching this episode. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me over. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>